And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us straight from Fire in the Head Productions. A, a man, a man behind the man behind Savage Ki Savage Kingdoms in all three of its editions. Now bringing the Savage East to its current third edition, the one and only Mike Yo. How you doing today, man? Hello. It's actually Mike Yao. Ultra. <laughs> <laughs> you got it right last time. Yeah. It's, <laughs> it's been it's been. Coming. And in my, and in all, and in all fairness, I'm probably not the only one who's made that blunder. Oh no, you're one of 184 people in the last two months. But yes, hello everybody, uh, and uh, thank you for having me back into the monastery. Thank you for, thank you for, thank you for coming back. Um, yeah. So, when it came, now, the Savage East, obviously this is not your first rodeo with it. Um, it was, as I recall, it, start, it was originally a Eastern expansion for first edition um, Savage Kingdoms. Right. Then it was in, then it was integrated into the core book with Reforged, which was why I said Reforged is more of a director's cut than a full-on second edition. Mm, right. That's fair. And then, and now, and now you're bringing the Savage East into um, th into its third into third edition form. Right. So before we before we obviously with a lot of this, there's gonna there's gonna be a lot more discussion about the about the setting lore than there is about the mechanics, which we focused on last time. So, yeah. I'll first start out when it came to when it came to the original Savage East. Was that something that you always had in the always had in the works, or was it something that kind of developed as you were do, as you were doing um, play testing? Uh, I think it was always in the works, and the reason I say I think is I'm not I'm probably eighty percent sure. But because the world was already, the setting was already kind of there, it was an, originally a Dungeons and Dragons setting. It became a Pathfinder setting when I didn't like 4th edition D&D along with most everyone else. Um, and then it sort of developed into its own thing, which warranted its own rule system. So the East was already kind of there, that continent, uh, or those two continents, I should say, Amanju and Hassan. Uh, so yeah, so it was. I think it was already kind of in mind that hey, if we expand, if like the core cool rulebook, the first edition does reasonably well, which it did for a small game, then I would do the second book and expand. So then the idea with Reforge was to combine it all together, and at first it was a great idea, and then I think it ended up not being the best idea because it ended up being like a five five hundred page book. And for perfect, anybody knows anything about perfect binding? That's like very borderline. So, uh, so good idea in some ways, but a poor idea in, in others. So within third edition, I decided to split it into the two different books, kind of like the first edition model. Uh, so yeah, so there we are. So yeah, to, I know it's a long answer for, uh, but yeah, I think the it was already kind of there in the back of my head. Yeah. Now, with a lot of the with a lot of the air, with a lot of the areas and a lot of the hit, a lot of the histories with with the first go at um, when it comes to the when it comes to the core setting of, of savage kingdoms um in a in a very howardian w way there's a lot a lot of the nations a lot of the factions are very clear and are very clear analogs to um to real to real world equivalents and i think i think in s i think in several instances you blat you blatantly name the name the um equivalents in the book <laughs> Right. Is the is that is that sort of equivalency still within the Savage East, just with uh, more Eastern cultures instead of more European ones? Yeah, that's yeah, it's definitely still there. Um, yeah, so you have, like you said, it's very Howardian uh, to where a lot of them are analogs. There's a couple of cultures that are more obscure, in some of the different realms, but eight, eighty, ninety percent of them are. Uh, as you'd said, you could pretty read into it after the first couple of paragraphs. You're like, oh yeah, this is this represents uh, ancient Persia. This represents ancient Egypt. 
this this may or may not be Babylon or Mesopotamia, you know. So uh, uh, the Yuntilan steppes may or not may or may not be the Huns uh, or the Mongolians. So yeah, there's a lot of analogs in there. And you know, as a game designer, and you, I'm sure you know this as well, and as an author, it's it's always a good way to shortcut things because if people have a general idea that oh, this is like the Roman Empire, this is like the Persian Empire. At least they have a shortcut knowledge of what that is from a role-playing standpoint. And then you could just add the little differences on, you know, to that. So, again, a long answer <laughs> to, to a yes. It's still there. And when it comes to, when it comes to the, uh, when it comes to the, um, those, those, when it comes to those sort of equivalents, I think, I think a lot of people look at a name like the Savage East and they're immediately thinking of, um, of east of east a of east asia primarily but as, right. I, but as I understand it your your um your particular aim as far as what the savage east covers more more or less more or less is the entirety of the of the of the silk road and fur, and further beyond that right yeah i mean really anything that's not occidental is in the the savage east so that includes a continent that's very African-esque, a uh, continent that's very uh, Arab-esque, but it also has Far Eastern touches as well. Now, uh, you, and it also... Oh, sorry. When you mention African-esque, I'm guessing you're specifically referring to North Africa? Uh, most, really all, all of Africa is covered except for some of the modernisms with the South African uh, settlers, etc. Uh, more indigenous African. So you've got, uh, for example, um, the Zunti tribes are kind of like the Zulu, uh, and it's kind of a catch-all. There's a lot of different tribes, but that's kind of the overall culture. Yeah. Uh, and then there's Ebenezu, which is kind of um, Mesopotamia, so therefore northern Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, these are just kind of you know general correlations. They're not uh, meant to really be read into anything specific. Uh, yeah, I'm taking the Robert he Howard approach. The reason he did the Highborn Age like that is because he didn't want people arguing history with him. So he just decided, I'll just make my own realms and kingdoms and just kind of you know, season them with real-world historical connotations. Wasn't it the case where um, where Hybor a lot of the a lot of the nations in 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 his in his world were meant to be were meant to be um, Proto proto examples of um, of of, ethni of ethnicities that would be that would be seen later on. Oh uh, yeah, that that was right. That was his kind of uh, non-meta reason for that mm -hmm. for um, that uh, exclamation. But yeah, you're right. You're right. Well, a lot that and, that and the whole thing that and the whole thing of the nations in a post Atlantis, which of course Atl um, Atlantis not only do not only doesn't exist even though even though so many even though so much stuff comes comes up out of it but I, <laughs> right i think it's i think it's always important to note that plato's republic is the and is the um ancient world equivalent to a hollywood movie <laughs> <laughs> right with the, with the grand yeah the grand thing that is atlantis and massive citadel and the seven rivers or whatever it is yeah <laughs> That's a pretty fair correlation. Mm -hmm. Definitely got some Numenorean stuff in there, which I think it's, Vulcan probably. It's a yeah, it's a, it's a fair correlation, and it's also a really good way to piss off all of my history majors. <laughs> all, all Two birds, one stone. <laughs> You know, it's important to have a relationship in some way or another. Yeah. Even if, <laughs> um, if it's frenemies. Now, give, now given, given that, um, 
one of the one of the big things that was real that was really added to third edition was a bit was a bit of a bit of an origin slash archetype setup instead of instead of going full freeform. And with Savage East third edition, is that still going to be in play? Yes. Uh, so those are called callings. Um, I think that's yeah the archetype system. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, and the Savage Kingdoms core rulebook, which is really you know you could really say the Savage West. Um, yeah, we established callings in third edition, which is kind of a call to the first two editions. We had life paths, but they weren't really mechanically valuable. They just kind of gave you an idea. Hey, I want to build an assassin. I want to build an alchemist. There's some talents you might want to look at, some skills, maybe even some weaknesses uh, and equipment. So uh, this gives you more mechanical um, benefits if you choose a calling. And you still don't have to, which is a cool thing, because some people really just like building whatever. But yes, to answer the question more directly, Savage East has five new call. I think it's five, might be six, five new callings to add that are more kind of Eastern-esque in a very generic sense. Uh, like Nomad and Cultist, uh, Samurai, Ninja. I actually almost didn't do those, but I ended up doing them. Yeah, I, and I, I remember when I looked at the comments for the announcement video, I remember some, some people saying that um, doing, a, doing, a, doing a Samurai career isn't necessary because, it would, because it's basically an equivalent to Knight. I, right. I don't necessarily, necessarily agree with that for, for, a bit, for a major reason. Um, with Savage Kingdoms is significantly more detail oriented when it comes to combat equi equipment and ge and general um, loadouts of characters within when it within its sandbox. Um, mm -hmm. And because because of that, the idea the idea of of co of combat styles when you're, when you're dealing with different availability and different preferred uh, methods has to be taken into account. Like right. when it, when it comes to the, it would be not unnatural for somebody who's playing a knight in core to be using sword and board, but when's the last time you saw a samurai use sword and board? Mhm. Mm right. Exactly. It was uh not not unheard of, but it was pretty rare. You're right, um, Mildred. Cause in the end, that's exactly what I, why I went for. Originally, I'm like, well, it's just an Eastern version of a knight. I mean, societally speaking, social status speaking, it's the same. Um, Duty-wise, it's even the same thing. Uh, virtually the same thing. Uh, but like you said, once you, once you break it down into more details, uh, a more Eastern-style knight might learn some more what we would consider, you know, consider more empty, you know, unarmed martial arts. Uh, not that Western knights weren't Badasses when it came to brawling as well, too. Those guys could get down as well, but just, you know, speaking from a purely sort of almost stereotypical sort of sense, I felt that it was enough to, to break it down into its own category. And there is a talent called Samurai, too, so you can literally take the talent without even the calling if you qualify for it. The, but if you want to double down on it, you can do Samurai Talent, Samurai Calling. The big, the big reason why I, um, why I focused on that focus on that kind of thing specifically is this is not if this w if this were a less crunchy system something something on the detail level of say fate um yeah i'd be perf i'd be perfectly willing to to uh, concede that to concede that but you're not do but you're not doing um a rules light game let's yeah i've um i've always been i've always been i don't know about you but i've always been against this idea of of tr of um, trying to take a one size fits all approach to martial characters. And there's definitely <laughs> none of that. No, I agree because I feel like you. Yeah, I just feel like you lose a lot. You know what I'm saying? It's almost like when you generalize everything. What are you, eventually you're just left with stick and warrior, and then you generalize that, and you're just left with adventurer. I mean, you know. So at some point you have to, to put a little a little detail on there. Now I understand, like if it's fate, that's to totally fine because that's a great system. But when you're trying to do, my, I guess Savage Kingdom is more rules medium, maybe even slightly on the. I don't know if I dare say heavy, but I guess kind of slanting that way. Like a one to ten, it's probably a six. Yeah. Six point five. Yeah. 
Right, that those being the nines and tens, I guess. So yeah, but but to your point, there is enough detail in there to not where it's difficult to throw out gladiator equals tribal warrior equals samurai equals knight. You know, it's it's just it's like that's just you're just throwing too much uh, baby out with the bash with the bathwater at that point if you're just omitting all of those things and distilling it down to one warrior archetype. Something I'm something I'm curious something I'm curious is you obviously you've obviously with um with careers like with careers like um samurai and ninja there's de there's def there's definitely the feudal Japan representation but I'm curious if there I'm curious if um there if there's an equivalent for say feudal um China or in, or India or the like yeah there is a there's a realm called Taikanara Taikanara is very uh ancient China, bordering on kind of early feudal China. Uh, and then there's two realms that kind of represent India or Indonesia, uh, Tashahari and Shamal. Um, so yeah, so they're, they're definitely there. And in fact, the only sort of Japanese type realm is actually Yana Khan. Um, and I, I kind of made it, and this is not to insult uh, anyone at all, because we are kind of living in that age where people get a little touchy with, with cultural things, but uh, like there are samurais in Taikanara, um, even though that's supposed to represent China, and the reason being because it's not actually China and Japan; it's just kind of derivative of them. But if you really, you know, if a GM really wanted to root it and be more quasi historical with it, you can just completely be well. All no, only samurai come from from Yana Khan. Uh, you know, uh, martial monks only come from Taikanara or, Taj, or Tajahari. Uh, so it's left kind of open. Uh, to to kind of deal with that how you want to, and that's on purpose because I you know I don't want to. First of all, I'm not they're not the actual cultures, uh, and secondly, and, and in fact, it's out of respect for those uh, cultures instead of like uh, uh, culture and appropriation. That seems to be kind of a thing nowadays that we have to kind of watch out for. Um, on, I'm of two I'm of two minds when it comes to that. On one on one hand. And I'm not, I'm not going to go down this ra this rabbit hole all this all that far, but on on one hand, yeah. I, under I understand I understand I understand the I understand the idea the idea. On the other hand, I do think some people use the term in um, bad faith. Mm, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Now. Exactly. Now, when it comes now, um, when it when it comes to one of the one of the one of the big th one of the big things when it comes to the s when it comes to the setup that you have with Savage Kingdoms is the talent system. And I know I know you dr you've um dropped remarks about about um, ta and there's been talent spe talent specifically added for s for um, Savage East in the previous editions. Is that still go is that still going to be the case and have any of them been refined since their um first edition dates? Yeah, there'll there'll definitely be new talents. I think there's about 50 to 60 new ones, in fact. Uh, and there's five different categories, just for everybody uh, to out there. There's uh, battle, mystical, social, subterfuge, um, and other. I think that's five, right? So yeah, there's some, definitely some new ones. And some of them have been refined. In fact, I think most of them have been refined, not only to fit the sleeker SK3 design, um, but also, just because a couple were clunky, you know, you go back and look at your old work and you're like, geez, what was I thinking when I wrote this thing up? No, 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 just trying to... First critic. Yeah, right. I mean, even now I'm kind of glancing at the core rule book going, what in the heck would... Like, what an awkward paragraph. I clearly could have done that better. Uh, but yes, yeah, so, uh, again, long answer. <laughs> but yeah, there will definitely be new talents. And uh, there's even some new weaknesses as well that are more kind of fitting... Um, I know this makes everybody cringe, but like Eunuch is there, uh, <laughs> uh, Primitive, I think, and there's a, there's a few others, I believe, that are kind of more, uh, kind of fitting of that kind of Conan-esque kind of exotic setting. Um, so. Which, now, um, now, 
I do remember. I do remember when I would get into link. When I'd get into lengthy debates about tr about trying to do, um, d trying to do D and D in a more Japan, a more Japan flavored setting, and s and some people just not get not getting that there were certain things you couldn't just reskin. Um, specific. And one of the specific things that would always that would always come up when it is when it came to spell casting. Simply because the closest equivalents to casters, when you look at when you look at a more fantastical take on Japan, would be things like, say, an on, a um, on Miyunji. Kinja. Or, yeah. Or, of course, L L five R had the sh had the Shugenja, and both of and Genja. are do not really fit the stereotype of the wizard, um, surrounded by scrolls in a tower in the middle of nowhere. They're effectively priests who have who have a legitimate position in mo in most um, courtly matters, right? Or magistrates, mm -hmm. uh, with you know of the lesser nobility. So, if, some, if somebody was to the was to theoretically try and try and build Yunji using the using the uh, talent setup that you have for the Savage East, where they where they inst where they cast directly through the use of of talisman and op and inch and putting power or effect into objects um how would th how would they do that so i would like first of all probably take the priest calling as you suggested mm -hmm. but beyond calling there's a talent called enchant talisman uh, and it's from the core rule book so it's technically a western thing as well yeah. so to where exactly what you said you you know you take a an object and you empower it uh, at least briefly with a spell and you can have up to three on your person at one time. I, I tried to come up with a more elegant way to explain why you would have seven or eight, but it just never... I mean, so I just, in the end, was like, you know, the, the spells are so close to each other, and they negate each other if it's more than three. But yeah, that's probably the primary way to, to go about it, would be to take Enchant Talisman as a mystical talent, and then maybe build it from a priest or monk base, maybe, or maybe even a noble calling. Now, you pro you probably watched as many Kurosawa films as as I am, being a, being a being as much of a film nut as we both are. <laughs> um, <laughs> and a lot a lot of times, especially especially within the within these sort of dramas, whether whether it be in uh, whether it be in swordsman story in swordsman stories in Wuxia or um, sa or samurai tragedies. There's all, there's often the conflict or the representation of different um, of different sword schools. Um, mm. Something that's more something that's more prevalent or less prevalent depending on which um, e which era. But right. when it comes when it comes to if somebody wanted to represent that their style comes from a specific school, um, would they mainly do that through the talents or would or have or have have you um, considered systems for um, for the, for specific school for being able to create specific schools or something like that? Yeah, I actually thought about that. Um, so far, I don't have it. Of course, the Savage East isn't completely written, so there is room. I sort of toyed with it through talents, and then I realized that the battle talents were just getting just getting you know a lot of. They were just becoming a, a, too many of them. Uh, but in the existing rules, you can kind of do it through weapon specializations, uh, through melee weaponry specialization, uh, for specific weapon types and specific forms. And then there's several martial arts stances that you can learn. That, so, so given between, uh, actually several, there's quite a bit of martial arts stances. There's probably 12 or 13 of them, from cobra style to mantis style to dragon style, etc. So between those and some of the cool combat maneuvers, Weapon specialties, I think it's kind of represented already. But I am looking into maybe uh, taking it a little bit further. Kind of borderline right now on that. But yeah, but uh, you can you could currently do that right now, I think, pretty well with the, the current system. All right. Now, when it comes to... When it com now, um, one, of the, one of the big, one of the big things... In the in the same kind of motif, and this this is something that this is something that um, is fa is fa is fairly co is fairly common within um, within a lot of classical societies, and that is the nature of um, du of dueling. Um, 
if somebody if somebody wanted to in, wanted to integrate that into a, into a session, um, how would how would you have them go about it? Uh, yeah, I, I'm I'm a big single combat honor duel person. <laughs> Um, so there's a, uh, there's a talent called Honor Duel, which is a good way to do it, other than just sheer role play. But Honor Duel actually gives you a mechanical, re like people have, you have to actually make a resolve roll, skill roll to resist being lured into a duel. That's kind of a cool way to do it. Um, it's, you know, not only, uh, again, we're kind of speaking mostly of feudal Japan, but uh, a lot of Western cultures too are very, you know, very honor based because, you know, back in the day that was really, People's form of currency was your reputation and your honor. So to be called on that and to, to have these cool epic single combats and these duels is, I think, is a really cool thing that resonates with me. And I think a lot of gamers as well, particularly fans of cinema, like you'd mentioned, just make such an epic scene. So yeah, using that uh, that one talent, and there's there's a couple other ways uh, of getting to that as well. But that definitely kind of keeps everybody there. And there's a weakness called. Um, Oathbound, uh, that uh, kind of forces you to have a little more sense of, of sense of honor, and then there's also weaknesses called uh, honorless uh, or oath breaker, which kind of plays against that. So it's kind of cool watching different players role play those aspects. You know, I challenge you, and then the oath breaker is like, whatever, I don't care, I don't have any honor, I don't. <laughs> it's just kind of uh, fun to watch that unfold. you mentioned now what when now um, when it comes to when it comes to um savage when it comes to savage east are there any are there any careers or callings that are being introduced specifically to that book or is or most is it mostly um would it mostly be using carryovers from um core uh so yeah so all the all the ones from core are available to the east but there's five new ones as well See if I can find them here. So, uh, well, let's see. Just off the top of my head, so we have the new ones are cultist. Um, I thought I had a uh, monk, as in warrior monk. Uh, you know, the typical fighting monk. Yep. Uh, samurai, ninja, and nomad. Those are the five. All right. So, so no, nomad kind of represents your desert cultures, even some of the steppes cultures. And uh, it was another one. It was interesting that you mentioned earlier, Mildred, about uh, separating knight and samurai. That was another one I was kind of like, does that really warrant its own thing? And as I did a lot of research, and I'm like, and then I was like, that totally warrants its own thing. That's You can completely build a character concept off of Nomad. And that would kind of typically be, to put it in a D&D &D sort of term, like sort of a ranger rogue in some ways you can even slant bard a little bit with a nomad you know as an entertainer kind of a desert gypsy if, if you if you will so yeah uh so that made the cut mm -hmm. now when it comes to since you mentioned since you mentioned um, ninja is one of them i want i want to go a bit into that um obviously 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 they even though I was born in the '90s, I did see the um, the carryover of a lot of the ninja craze that happened in the '80s, um, especially as some, especially as a comic book But there's, but there's yeah. been plenty of interpretations when it comes to how to handle how to handle ninja, both with both within fantasy gaming and within popular fiction of all sorts. Um, right. in, in some cases, going with the whole master of master of tools these these spies and, and the like and some go some going with the more um out there approaches with with specialized kinds of magic and the like um do you um do you, does the ninja career have a le have a leaning towards one or the other it's actually kind of built to where you can go either way i sort of did and i Reason, reason I say either way is you're, you kind of hit on what I think typically happens with ninja. You've got the typical uh, assassin kind of shadow magic-y person, maybe with bits of alchemy, you know, making smoke grenades and that sort of thing. And then you've got the, according to my research, a little bit more historical, where they're actually more spies, information gatherers, uh, coming from clans that were not noble, and this is kind of how they oppose the samurai in some way. So really, you can kind of build either of those or a combination of those. I, I kind of did that on purpose. Which, 
Because, you know, every, every 13-year-old boy wants to play a ninja. Yeah. I've noticed. <laughs> That's fair. I mean, in fact, there are 43-year-old men who want to play n ninja. Oh. <laughs> Look, I, I, um, I have... I have traumatic memories of those go of those goddamn birds in the original Ninja Gaiden, okay? <laughs> yeah. It's weirdly, I know what you're talking about. <laughs> well, you, well, um, you, ha you probably have just as many memories about Nintendo Hard, which is just a synonym for bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm a good bit older, but I, but I, but I totally know what you're talking about. <laughs> I mean, I know. I mean, there's cer there are certainly bigger offenders. Reduce their heads. But, <laughs> true. <laughs> but it doesn't it doesn't make the line any less tr any less true. So <laughs> let's uh, let's let's dig a little bit let's dig a little bit further in further into that. When it comes to when it comes to that career, um, if somebody if somebody wanted to go, if somebody wanted to go the more grounded approach where the closest where any sort of magical approach that they have is just is just tool is just tool use um how would they go, how would they go about that and if they wanted to go with the whole um the whole breathing breathing fire and all the and all the other bits of craziness um <laughs> about that so uh, as to the as to the former the the tool user uh, I would you would probably take mostly subterfuge talents, maybe some social talents. These 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 are talents that might give you stuff like gossip, um, where you can spread gossip as well as gather it. You're very talented at it. Um, secret strike, actually that's combat. Uh, but things that kind of give you more grounded approaches to um, to spying, information gathering, that sort of thing. Uh, whereas the other build would be mostly through mystical talents, through uh, magical arts, particularly magical arts shadow. And alchemy is also another skill that's its own thing. I know a lot of tabletop role-playing games kind of fold alchemy and magic together. So I'm taking a kind of a high ward, uh, how wording, uh, how wardian approach to where alchemy and magic, though similar, sometimes are different in the stories. Like you see... Tothamon using clearly some weird elixir in one story, and then the next time he's doing some clear, like ritual spell. Yeah. So, um, so you can actually through alchemy build things like uh, acids that burn through locks or rope or um, smoke grenades, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, and when it now, when it now when it comes to the when it comes to the um, nomad career. Um, since you mentioned you mentioned it being it being very much um, being based on the the um, archetype of wanderers on the ste on the steppes or or some of the no some of the nomadic tr some of the nomadic tribes in the, in a bit in a bit in the near east um, do is do they have a bit do they have a bit of a head start when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to mounted based talents. Uh, yeah, there's actually one way. So, in fact, when you choose, there's actually a talent called Nomad. Um, and the reason I have talents that are named the same as a lot of the callings is this allows you, if you're building a character that doesn't choose a calling, you can still take that talent as a social background. So, Nomad gives you, uh, you can choose like mountain, steps, or desert is like your favorite terrain. So, yeah, there are different ways. And there's also even a talent called Mountaineer that kind of uh, explains that you're from a more mountainous desert realm. Um, or, or just purely from a mountainous realm. Yeah. Uh, whereas, in, you know, the people would then become really more semi-nomadic than purely nomadic if you were mountain-based, uh, historically speaking. But yeah, you can represent all those different types of nomads, gypsies, semi-nomads. Mm -hmm. Now, when it comes... To, now, um, one, per, one particular motif that, that I'm sure we're, that we're both familiar with to some, to some regard is the um, Ronin. The way oh, yeah. the, ma the masterless sa samurai. Masterless samurai, yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to the, given that samurai is one of the careers that you mentioned, would they and would they and for someone who wanted to play that kind of motif of the of the Ronin, would then would they end up taking taking the samurai career or would or would it be better served with one of the others? 
Yeah, I would take, uh, in fact, someone, a friend of mine just built the, this type of exact type of character maybe two or three weeks ago. So he took the Samurai Calling and then took Masterless as a weakness. Uh, and that, just those two things there really already kind of built his main concept. Which still allowed him to take um, favored talents and favored skills from the Samurai Calling itself to explain that he, that he had the training. And then Masterless is a weakness allowing you to uh, you can't join any elite orders. Uh, for, it's the main drawback, which is why it's a weakness. So, um, and he just explained, you know, further in his character background that he was masterless because his ma I think he even killed his master. This guy was like a pretty serious. I think he even had tainted as a weakness, which is like really the only way to be actually evil in the setting. Uh, I think he killed his master, and then now he's masterless. So. He was definitely <laughs> building this kind of dark Ronin character, which I thought was going to be interesting. But he hasn't played him yet, but it'll be really interesting to, to see him go into play. Now, some, 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 cultures, th some cultures throughout the East um, one, one had, as part, had as part of their identity a full-on a full caste system. And I'm curious if, I'm curious if, there, if there's certain weaknesses that you have within them. Within the Savage East, that reflect this kind of thing. Oh, but actually, that's a really good one that I might do. <laughs> so, there's a couple of cultures that have built-in caste systems, though. Already, uh, the Tajaharan and the uh, Shamal. These are kind of based on ancient India. Um, but you know, I, I, again, I kind of left it loose to let people play with, and I didn't want to hit too close to home or whatever. But the idea of a weakness uh, doing that is actually a really good idea. So I might steal your idea idea there, Mildred, right. if you don't mind. Right. <laughs> I might. I might tinker. Once we get off this call, I might tinker with that and see if I can come up with... And then the Sleer cast base, too. The Sleer are the serpent folk. Yeah. They are almost literally cast. Like, you're born a specific uh, coloration, and that denotes your cast within their society. Yeah. Now, when it comes to, when it comes to equipment, I'm, I'm guessing that you've got the equipment list is going to be expanded to accommodate for the for the different cultures being represented in the savage east yeah correct for for example weapons i now have toll wars you know which are great scimitars mm -hmm. such cool imagery there um katanas i mean katanas are very close to not to get into the bait between katanas and western longswords um they're really very similar and i know all the people that are into katanas will be like oh but no i'm like they're really they're the viking swords were really really good uh samurai swords were folded hundreds of times of course because japanese Jap japan was metal poor so they had to be really good quality uh so but anyway i ended up still statting them slightly different because after doing some research i did realize there was some difference you do have a chisel point the katana it's not quite as heavy as a long sword um yeah, and then, like I said, the Tolwar uh, whips are there. Actually, I might have had them in core rulebook. Uh, Katars, you know, the punching daggers. Uh, Katars are there. I'm trying to think what else. I think I even have a boomerang uh, from the Mezca, because there's also a, an isle continent called Mezca, which represents kind of Central, uh, Central America in the real world. Uh, Aztec, Mayan sort of feel to it. Um, yeah. I don't, I have a, well, I have a maca is about the, you know, the big spiked cl or uh, edged clubs. Yeah, that's what, that's what I'm referring to. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, I was just using the shorter term. But yeah, they're, they are, uh, I think they're, the core rulebook, there's war club, which I thought was close enough, but I think I actually statted out a maca just to, uh, I think it was slightly different enough. So that should probably be in there. It may not be. If it's not, it'll just be a war club. The core rule book. If if not, I'd, if not, I'd probably just have it that it's a war club that can do that can do piercing damage once. Cause yeah, I, and right. In fact, you're 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 about spot on. I think um, if, if I have the stats for oh yeah, I do have it. It's exactly what you just said. It's war club with armor piercing one, because the club doesn't have armor piercing. So in other words, it doesn't bonus point of damage. Is really what armor piercing in Savage Kingdom is just a fancy term for bonus damage. 
even though it's tech even though it's technically a club it um somebody using it right could take could take someone's head off with it yeah right and they even edged it in jade and obsidian often or boat you know so you're right it was like an edge club I and mean, it's very strange but cool weapon um, no. and scimitars are there mm -hmm. um, scimitar being the obvious near eastern weapon <laughs> Oh, listen, remind me of what that one, I think I know what it is, but is that the, um, no, I was thinking, it's not a, it's like, not like, not a, uh, inverted curved blade, is it? No, you, no, um, no, the, no, inverted, you're thinking, you're thinking of a Kopesh. Um. Yeah, I do have Kopeshes, yeah, no, I, I was thinking of something else, and that's a good idea, though, I do have Kopeshes scattered out. about it is the ba the back end of it was flattened so it could be used as a club oh yeah 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 okay i don't have that one actually maybe i should look into that that would be cool i don't have any blatant polynesian cultures i probably should the closest thing you you could get would be mezcan uh living on the coast of mezca would would i think influence a polynesian right but yeah i know now i know what you're talking about i think didn't they occasionally attach ropes to them there's some historical evidence that they use them for short-range throwing, and they would draw them back in. I might be thinking of something else. No, but since you mentioned that, I'm curious if um if one of the items, <laughs> the items you have on the list is rope darts. Harpoon or rope dart? Uh, I don't think I do. I might do one though. I do have a harpoon, so a rope dart would be probably a lighter version. Yeah, the d the dart is about the is about the size of it of a um, dagger, and in that. Same vein since we're since I'm talking about weapons in that region. Um, did you put in the twin hooks? No, no, no. Uh -uh. So th this is the thing. Like, um, there's like a rabbit hole that you could go down with like 200 new weapons. Yeah. So it's kind of like, how many do I want to pare down to just do maybe like 15 new ones? The, um, yeah, but but all those are really good though. Um, I do remember getting in debates with someone who said that who said that. Um, if somebody wanted to do the twin hooks, they could ju they could just reskin um, short swords. I don't I don't agree. Mm. With that. Yeah, I don't. Um. I think those are two different. The kukris, kukris, and the uh, yeah, I, I, yeah. I think they're different enough. The the um, twin when it comes the the um, big re the big reason why I'd say the twin why I'd say that when it comes to the twin hooks is. The whole, the whole hook isn't an edge. The main edge is, is at the top of it. Um, and right. you, can go, you can go a bit mid-range by, li by linking the hooks together. Um, yeah. So I, I, can, I can rationalize how it, how it would work. I'm just kidding. And the other, another one that's certainly a staple when it comes to ninja archetypes that I'm curious if you put in was um, the Kusari Gama. Yeah, the Kasari Gama. I, I started statting one out, and then I kind of, like, lost interest. <laughs> so I might go back to it. Because it is very interesting. Kind of like the double hooks. Very complex weapon. Yeah. I feel like it, once you master it, it would be really hard to defend because you see no one else using it. Which, is, you know, is part of the point. But yeah, it would be... Again, it's kind of like a rabbit hole thing. It's like, uh, do I want to do 15 or 20 or 200 weapons and then you have to catch yourself going am i just duplicating a weapon that's already there that you could just kind of reflavor slightly yeah i, th I th when it comes to when it comes to the kusar I, when it comes to something like the kusari gama i do think that is unique enough yeah i would agree yeah there's nothing that close to that mm -hmm. i did start out uh nunchaku because those are pretty different i mean you could make a case that they're light flails but i think they're different enough Right. Yeah. Um, 
medi medieval flails were um, were a lot heavier and were designed to be armor killers. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, nunchaku is more, is more along the line of a um, of something that's a bit, something that was made for um, feints. Feints, disarming, and maybe some minor damage to unarmored opponents. Yeah, and also I think another thing people forget it was a uh, it was often a concealable weapon. Yeah, cause... Like it, it would pass by imperial guards as like, oh, that's a couple of sticks in a guy's belt, <laughs> or if they even saw it at all. Well, uh, which I think is why I gave it a. It's just a thresher. Yeah, right. Yeah, because farmers, agricultural men, could just be like, yeah, this is one of my threshers. Hmm. They're like, all right, yeah, whatever, cool, Pat, go on. And then suddenly Bruce Lee comes to life. Uh, and he's deflecting ping pong balls. So watch that. Watch that on YouTube if you get a chance. <laughs> um, now, when so, when it when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to set to um, when, it, when you mentioned the di when you mentioned the different stances earlier, could you g could you give me a few examples of what of what some of those stances um, strengths and weaknesses might be? Not. Not all of them, but just a few highlights. Okay. Let me open up to Savage East, because I'm not sure if I can remember what some of these do. Um, all right, so, for example, I'll start with Dragon Stance, just because it's, like, the first one that popped up. So, uh, Dragon Stance is, uh, so there's about, I think I said 14 or 15 of them. Dragon Stance, to use the first example, it, uh, so when you pop into the stance, it takes an action to do so, and SK-3 is built on two-action standard in a six-second round. Um, so it takes an action to use the stance, meaning that your second action would either have to be an attack, I mean, you could still move and do something else, but the point of being in the stance is probably to attack. So it gives you armor piercing on your punch or kick, because you're fighting, you're basically fighting in dragon claw, stand, you know, grabs and punches. Very similar to tiger, tiger, uh, tiger style. And you can also build upon that. So the cool thing about stance is you can take a talent later on that builds on it. Like there's one called Armor of the Dragon. And if you have Dragon Stance, you can then pr uh, gain the talent of Armor of the Dragon. And it gives you plus one armor uh, to represent a dragon scales. Now it's not literally you're becoming dragon scaled. It's just that you've learned to fight as a dragon and shrug off damage. A little bit more. So that's that's one example. Uh, another example is Crane, and I kind of took this from, <laughs> from Karate Kid, to be quite honest, because you know, kid of the '80s. Uh, so it gives you, it increases your kicking damage, maximum kiss, kicking damage by two, just from Crane style. Uh, so anyway, that's a couple of examples. Uh, I guess another cool one is uh, which one? Monkey style. So eventually, you can get grip of the monkey. I think D and D or Pathfinder did this, right? Wasn't there something called yeah, Monkey Grip? Yeah, monkey Grip, and you bet your ass I abused the hell out of out of that, so I could. <laughs> I'm, I did. I've done that. I've done it multiple times, and my GM hated me for it. Of <laughs> dual of dual wielding great swords using you, by abuse. <laughs> right. I do remember that being abused. Hopefully, my version is less abused, but I guess we'll see. Yeah, it's the same general thing because it is an actual uh, thing in Eastern lore that it's hard to dis So basically, its thing is it's hard to disarm somebody that's a uh, fight to the monkey group. Uh, and then there's, um, uh, I don't want to wear out the example too much, but just really quickly, Mantis Stance gives you, what does Mantis do? You can eventually get uh, Leap of the Mantis and like take uh, much further leaps than normal. Uh, I think you can do that with Dragon Stance eventually as well, too. So, and there's a bunch of others. I don't want to go into all of them. Cobra Stance is one. Oh, yeah, Cobra Stance. I just said I wasn't going to go into them, and now I am. <laughs> Cobra Stance gives you a bite attack because you learn to fight uh, kind of like a Cobra does. You can actually bite. Now, it's not a lot of damage because you're just using your regular teeth. But it does give you that uh, opportunity. And then eventually you can learn to spit uh, poison out like a cobra does, actual alchemical poison. And, and, and it also gives you like uh, some resistance to poison. Because obviously you can die of swallowing <laughs> any poisons. But. 
You know, it's interesting. Some of these are based on real historical lore and some of it fact. You know, some there's some of these uh, some African and Indian cultures have learned to. Um, there's some tribes that spat poison, that spat venom at people, and they just learn to build up their tolerance to carrying these poisons in their mouth. Very interesting. Yeah, there was a. It, when you mentioned spitting poison, the immediate because because of because of my background, the immediate thing I end up thinking of is Great Muda. Oh. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, so <laughs> some of this stuff is kind of rep and there's a, a talent called Blow the Dust. Um, I mean, there's a couple of African tribes that, that uh, blow dust into the eyes of their opponents, uh, which is just, I just found interesting. Now, obviously, the range isn't that great, but you, if you use a blow gun, you can triple the range. There is that, but. Yeah, is it right? Yeah, it's made really just for hand to hand, but, but anything you know it catches your opponent off off guard for a moment. Um, well, at any there's there's no such there's no such thing as a as a dirty trick in a fight. Yeah, yeah, and there's a talent called dirty tactics, mm -hmm. so you can do all that kind of stuff. But you're right. Yeah, it's uh, honor kind of goes out the door when you're in a survival fight. Given the given the use of stances and given the and given the presence of a of a um, warrior monk um, career, um, one thing that I'm one thing that I'm curious about is how is how you would possibly utilize the talents to try and give to try and present a, an approximation of different um, martial arts styles. And if you if you don't mind, I'd like to go through a, I'd like to go through a few real world examples and just see and just see how you. Um, try and go with an equivalent in the talent system. Okay. Um, I'll start. I'll start with one that I've used. A, I've used a lot through my gaming history. Um, Muay Thai. Oh yeah. Yeah, Muay Thai is really cool. I practiced some of that a long time ago, and then I got away from it. Uh, so that would probably be. Let's see. It's a little bit crane, but it's also. So that's a good one, Muay Thai. I would say crane style represents it pretty good, but probably monkey style as well, because um, there's a lot of kicks involved, which is crane, and then but the monkey style can uses uses a lot of recovery techniques as well. Yeah, that's a pretty that's kind of a tough one actually. I think that's probably the best way to do it. Oh, um, oh yeah. So there's one called there's a style called Jeanne, which is based on a French fight. So there is kind of a Occidental martial art, if you will, Jeanne. So that might be the closest one to that. And it also kind of um, represents uh, Israeli fighting art, where you try to finish your opponent off in like ten seconds. Yeah. Um, uh, What's that? Kav Magra. Yeah, uh, being fairly similar, yeah, to that. Um, and it's more of a kind of a boxing technique. It's a lot of closed fist maneuvers. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, pancration. Oh. Mm, maybe monkey style again? Possibly cobra? Both of them, perhaps, blended together. Yes, I could, I could see. <laughs> well, pan, for all intents and purposes, pancreation is ju is just um, is just is Greek wrestling. Um, right. Yeah. I, well, in that case, yeah, in that case, and often naked, um, or at least just a like a a, a single belt that you grab the hold of. But yeah, that would probably be. You're right. Probably not even an Eastern, more Eastern style. Probably just brawling. Lots of levels and brawling. Be a Pridonian because that represents ancient uh, Greek in the world, and maybe specialize in that and pancreation or yeah. a particular style. But that that almost becomes more sport than, than than well. I mean, you could fight like that. Obviously, you could use a lot of those techniques. But well, since, since you mentioned since you mentioned, um, since you mentioned sports, 
um, what give especially some especially somebody somebody might go, might decide to go Mimi with this and say I want to play a sumo. <laughs> yeah, well, I guess <laughs> be Yannicka knees and um, calling. Not really a brawler call. I guess I, I would probably go monk again. You know, warrior monk, and then uh, excel at brawling. Yeah, specialize in sumo style brawling instead of or pancreate. I mean, it's almost the same thing. Uh, in a way, the techniques between pancreate, pancreate, um, pancreation, and um, um, uh, sumo is uh, pretty similar. A lot of throws. You know, you're trying to grab your opponent, throw them off balance. I haven't seen anyone build a sumo yet. Weirdly enough, I've I've had I've had a I've had a couple I've had a couple cases of it. Um, inclu- it's cool, especially especially since I've um, when when I had a, when I had a copy of Oriental Adventures in print, I had used I'd use that a few I'd use that a few times when somebody wanted to do that. Um, mainly mainly as a response because I kept putting so many push effects in the dungeons. Completely yeah, wanted if, a, they wanted a build that was that was going to be near impossible to push. Yeah, I get that strength up high. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> or in Savage Kingdoms, your physique. Yeah, yeah I still remember in Second Edition D anD D they had things called kits, and there was a sumo kit, if I recall, I don't which were basically know, subclasses. I don't if there was a sumo kit in Oriental Adventures because it's been it's been a while. Um, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me if there was, though. Um, it'd be very tempting for me to for me to bring up an for me to bring up an instance when it comes to kung fu, but the problem is there's way too many styles. <laughs> yeah. It's like what, fifteen yeah. different styles of kung fu? It's, it's like, where where do I even start? So I'll go with some. I'll go with something simpler and ask how they how you'd adapt something like um, tai chi. Okay, just tell me when we're coming in. Are we already in? Yeah. Oh, okay. Hi. Hi, everyone. We're back in. Uh, tai Chi. Oh, yeah. So very water. Um, maybe Crane. No, I keep reusing the same ones. Crane. I, I probably should do a water style. Just literally call it water style. Have the four elements. Or actually five, if we're talking Chinese lore with wood. So yeah, maybe crane or I don't have a fish or any kind of like water style, but that'd be good for a GM to create. Yeah. Yeah, very flowy. Mm-hmm. Oh, oh wait, lotus stance. There is a style called lotus stance. It's the only style that's not really animal. It's a uh, plant. The base is supposed to be calming. Um, it's often practiced in the lotus position. And um, yeah, so maybe Lotus or Crane would be cool for Tai Chi. Yeah. Now, the the now you're about two thirds from to from your you're about a third away from your goal the le- at the time of this recording. Um, what would you be shooting for as far as a release window? Uh, right, so the current Kickstarter, or actually it's Indiegogo, is about uh, yeah, a little over two-thirds funded. So a lot of these are kind of doing the usual thing where they start off pretty quickly and then they, they slow down to almost nothing, and that's <laughs> unfortunately what we're in right now. But usually they pick up a little bit towards the end. So yeah, we're just looking for 1,500, mo- very modest goal. Right now we're about a little 1091 or something weird like that. Uh, 1046. So yeah, so everybody, anybody wants to help us out, contribute, uh, you get some pretty cool stuff for a cool system, I think. Slightly biased, obviously. <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, and uh, I know some people have re- probably are like, you know, okay, there's this third edition in like seven years. So the answer to that is, if you're an indie game designer, you probably know where I'm coming from. You almost have to like reinvent the game every two or three years. And then secondly, I feel like this edition really cleans up a lot of things. 
from the previous two uh, or previous one and a half because like Mildred said reforged really is like a director's cut or a 1.5 edition so technically this is really probably would be the second edition but the math is easier I tight you know I tighten that up on purpose um, yeah I just feel I mean I was pretty proud of the original editions but I'm I definitely um, am behind this one I, I've been having some slight burnout on it a, a little bit maybe just because it is so minor, and we're not doing so well in the Indiegogo, but I'm still here. I mean, it'll pick back up, so. And I'll certainly be looking forward to, to uh, bearing witness to the results with, with time. Um, but with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness at play here. Yes. Thanks for having me. Time you see fit to return to the temple, whether whether it's whether it's for more of Savage Kingdoms or just a glorified chit post or to laugh at the <laughs> gods being cruel to everyone. Um, yeah, I, I would be glad to be back. The, and I do have a just real quick, uh, Mildred. I do have a D and D fifth edition version of Savage Kingdoms. I know that's uh, selling out a little bit, uh, so I don't know if I'll ever release it, but it's about three quarters of the way done. Yeah, yeah. So maybe we can talk about that some other time. So, but um, as I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> and of course, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then. On behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra. I am your gaming monk. Stay fucking frosty, everybody.